Hello and welcome. My name is Sabine Ostrowski. I'm the National Manager of Healthcare Relations at the MDFA and welcome to MDFA's last webinar of MAC Month 2022, Non-Neovascular AMD, an update on novel interventions and clinical assessment. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, the MDFA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. Before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. As per usual, you are muted and you, um, your videos are off. If you would like to ask questions, we would love to hear from you. We get you to enter those in the Q&A box. Of course, tonight's event is OA accredited for 1.5 CPD hours. There is a link that you will have to complete to get the full 1.5 hours of CPD, and it's in the chat box as we speak. You will need to fill out the MCQs during the webinar, so I suggest you open them now so that you can uh, make sure you have the answers as we will be referring to slides that are being shown during the presentation. And tonight we are delighted to have a panel of speakers from the Centre for Eye Research Australia. Um, later you'll be hearing from Professor Robin Geimer, AM, the Deputy Director of CIRA and the Head of Macular Research at CIRA, as well as Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. She's also a Senior Retinal Specialist at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. You'll also be hearing from Sandy Rezk, who is an optometrist and the Clinical Trial Coordinator at CIRA, as well as from Jason Taylor, who's an orthoptist and also a Clinical Trial Coordinator at CIRA. But our first speaker tonight is Dr. Zi Chao Wu, who is Principal Investigator and Head of Clinical Biomarkers Research at CIRA, a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Melbourne and an optometrist. Welcome, Zi Chao. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm not share the screen, so that's all right, Sabine. I might, um, I think I can do it with you. Um, so may, you may just need to stop sharing screens. Oh, yeah, perfect, thank you. Alrighty, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight um, for um, this talk. And thanks Sabine for introducing us as well. I'd love to start um, tonight by giving you a brief, cap, a brief recap of how AMD is currently classified before Jason and Sandy tell you a bit more about how we now assess AMD. Now, the early stages of AMD are characterized by the presence of drusen, which are yellow deposits present in one in seven Australians that are 50 years or older. And those with the early stages of AMD are at risk of developing either atrophic AMD, which is characterized by the loss of the outer retinal tissue that can progressively enlarge, or new vascular AMD, which is the exudation and hemorrhaging. Now, you may be aware a landmark paper nearly 10 years ago now um, developed an international consensus-based clinical classification of AMD to ensure consistent nomenclature across our field, which is especially crucial now in an era where new treatments for specific stages of the disease are being developed. Now, this classification system quite importantly considers people with small drusen, less than 63 microns, as having normal aging changes rather than having AMD. And people with medium drusen are considered as having early AMD, and people with either medium or large drusen associated with the absence or presence of pigmentary abnormalities are considered as having intermediate AMD. And late AMD, obviously, is the neovascular or atrophic forms of late AMD. And it's important to note that this classification is a person-level classification, meaning that if someone is large drusen in one eye and new vascular AMD in the other eye, right, that person is considered to have late AMD. And that, um, the other thing to note with this too is that these features are evaluated within two disc diameters of the fovea. So that's the brief overview of how we now classify AMD. So let me pass on to Sandy, who will tell us a bit more about the features 
in the early stages of AMD. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Great, thanks, C. So I'll just share my screen. Perfect. So yeah, as he mentioned, we'll just discuss some of the key clinical features of um, early stages AMD. Uh, first, we'll just start by reviewing normal OCT anatomy. And the uh, retina can be divided into three parts. So just go to the next slide. Yep, there we go. So we've got the inner retina, outer retina, and the choroid. So the outer retina is made up of these layers, so the external limiting membrane, the photoreceptors, and the RPE, followed by the basement Brooks membrane. And here is just a color fundus photo showing drusen. So drusen is the hallmark clinical feature of early AMD. They are the yellow lesions that can appear indistinct on color fundus photos, and because of their location, below the RPE, they do not appear to obscure the retinal blood vessels. So next example here is the OCT, and you've got the drusen underneath the RPE layer. Uh, they're usually dome-shaped, so just like here, um, and this example shows shallow sub-RPE deposits. So the next example shows um, early drusen, um, early AMD, with more discrete deposits. And here is the OCT with slightly more um, elevated drusen deposits. And this is a colored fundus photo showing the extensive drusen, um, which yeah, is quite exaggerated. And here the OCT B scan shows um, also quite extensive drusen uh, as large RPE elevations. So uh, to recap, drusen can be seen uh, between the RPE and Brooks membrane on the OCT, uh, and this helps to allow accurate assessment of the size, shape, internal reflectivity, and the homogeneity of the drusen. Uh, pigmentary abnormalities is another AMD clinical feature that we commonly see. Um, they can be seen as these clumps of dark pigment, which you can see here and here. Um, or areas of pigment loss, so presenting as more paler regions of the retina on the color fundus photo. And on the OCT, the pigmentary disturbances correlate with some hyperreflective foci, um, so just overlying the truth in here. And these foci are discrete lesions of high reflectivity. Uh, they're located above the RPE band, as you can see here. And they're largely the result of sick or dead RPE cells migrating towards the inner retina. And this example here shows more hyperpigmentary changes as well on the RPE. And so you can see these hyperpigmentary changes just there. And this OCT line scan through a large drusen um, again shows the overlying hyperreflective foci attached to the apex. And so that's suggestive um, of the drusen progressing to late AMD compared to those drusen without. And again, another color fundus photo showing circumscribed and um, RPE hyperpigmentary changes. Um, again, just there. So these foci align with the hyperpigmentary changes that you see on the color fundus photo. So this hyperreflective foci in the OCT um, corresponds to these hyperpigmentary changes on the color fundus photo. And again, highlighting um, how this drusen is at high risk of progressing to geographic atrophy or CNV. So hyperreflective foci, an important risk factor of progression to late stage AMD. And now we'll discuss uh, reticular pseudodrusen or RPD, which we like to call it. And this can be easily missed um, during a clinical exam. Um, this example here, the color fundus photo does show extensive RPD. So you can sort of appreciate it um, superiorly here and inferior. And uh, it can be missed, however, half the time on color fundus photos. Um, so it is more visible on other imaging modalities, such as the near infrared, fundus autofluorescence. Um, we'll look at an example of the OCT. 
Uh, so OCT is an excellent imaging modality to identify the location and shape of these lesions. So you can appreciate here, this is an RPD lesion, this here, um, and this. So uh, that helps to differentiate them from typical drusen. And so RPD are subretinal, so they're between the RPE and the neurosensory uh, retina, in contrast to conventional drusen that lie below the RPE band here. So drusen you'd find below the RPE. Uh, this is another example with less extensive RPD. Um, and then when you look at the OCT line scan, um, again, the arrows are just pointing to the RPD lesions. So there's multiple uh, reticular pseudodrusen lesions here, uh, and they're visible as these conical and wavy like structures. So RPD is a risk factor for progression in unaffected fallow eyes of individuals with unilateral CMB. Um, however, studies suggest that in the early stages of AMD, it's not necessarily a risk factor for progression. Um, patients with RPD are more likely to complain of impaired dark adaptation. And later in this talk, we will discuss a paper um, just explaining how RPD is a potential modifier of treatment response. So, yeah, reticular pseudodrusen, an important clinical AMD phenotype. And that briefly covers the main AMD clinical features in the early and intermediate stages of AMD. Um, which are important uh, risk factors for progression. So I'll pass on to Jason now, who will discuss what GA typically looks like. <laughs> so, thanks, Sandy. Um, hey, everyone, my name is Jason, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about geographic atrophy today. So when we're talking about geographic atrophy, we're referring to cell death in the RPE layer. So give me two seconds. Lovely. So this is just a color fundus photo. And it's basically showing sharply delineated areas of RPE depigmentation. So this is a small patch of atrophy that's present on the color fundus photo, and we can see it grow over time. So in order to be classified as geographic atrophy using Beckman's classification, we need the atrophy size to be over 175 microns. It needs to have the vessels visible on the knee and it needs to be visible on a color from this photo. So multimodal imaging is a really great way to sort of get different um, information about the lesion, lesion size and shape. Um, with a fundus autofluorescence photo, um, you can see that it presents as a visible hypo autofluorescent area, so these patches here. And on infrared, um, the increased light makes it appear as hyperreflective. So this is a color fundus photo showing the trophic um, AMD or GA at 36 months, and this is the corresponding B scan. So a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Notice how the upper e layer has really thinned out and it's allowing a lot more light to pass through. So if we take it back a step and look at the progression over time, at the start, we can notice just these little bits of druse in here. We've got some hyperreflective foci leading. And at six months, we can see the early stages of what we call nascent GA or NGA start to develop. So if you notice these layers sort of subsiding and falling into each other, and just this little wedge here, where my arrow is pointing, so just in black. So over time, we can see that the subsidence of this inner retinal layers into the outer retina becomes a lot more obvious, and the lesion size starts to expand horizontally. So at 18 months, once again, the lesion's grown and those layers are really obvious subsiding into one another. 24 months, you can sort of see the progression over time. And then at 36 months, we have the clinical markers for geographic atrophy. So you can see that the RP has really sort of diminished, allowing more light to pass through. So when we talk about NASA GA, there's two things we look for in B-scan. So it can be either or of these two things. So the first thing we look for is a hyperreflective wedge, which is this right here, or we look for subsidence of the layers in the inner retina, which is this. When we're looking at GA, 
we're looking at the RPE really sort of diminishing, which allows this light to pass through into the choroid. And you can see the subsidence of the inner retina into the outer retina is really, really obvious. So all these layers here have really fallen into each other. Just going to give you a couple of case studies, so four to be exact, just to really hone in the point of NGA versus GA. So for this first example, um, you can see subsidence of these retinal layers here, which is really obvious. And when you when it progresses into GA on the B scan, you can see that that up E layer has completely disappeared, and it's allowing a lot of light to pass into the choroid. And you also have these subsidence of the inner retinal layers, really obvious. You can really notice that. Um, for this one, exact same thing. The hyperreflective wedge here is really obvious, and you can sort of see subsidence of the layers. And as it progresses into GA, once again, the lesion has expanded horizontally. You can see that the RP layers disappear, which once again allows that light to pass through. So that's a really important clinical marker. Um, with the third case study for NGA, this is a really good one because you can see the subsidence of the inner retinal layers and you also got your hyperreflective wedge in Henley's layer there. And as it progresses to GA, you can see that that retina is thinned out and more light is passing through. The last one, just to hit the point home, with NGA, you're looking for either subsidence of these layers here or you're looking for this hyperreflective wedge. And once it progresses to GA, you're looking for that RPE to sort of diminish and increase light passing into the choroid. This is just a really quick summary. So if you guys want, feel free to take a picture of this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something and thank you for listening. Right. Thanks very much, Jason, for that um, helpful explanation. And later on for the MCQs, we'll be going through some of the questions that relate to some of these scans that Sandy and Jason have described. So I might get you to stop sharing Jason, Sandy, if that's okay, and I'll pop on. Next slide, thank you. All right, now uh, in this next segment, um, Robin and I will give you a bit of an update on new treatments and on the horizon for these people with non-neovascular AMD, um, the features that Jason and Sandy have just told you about. And I'd love to start tonight by telling you about a recent treatment trial that we've completed for people with the early stages of AMD. So, the LEAD study, or the Laser Intervention in the Early Stages of AMD study, is a landmark 36-month randomized controlled trial that we undertook to assess the safety and efficacy of a subthreshold nanosecond laser in intermediate AMD. Now, this trial was conducted at five sites in Australia and one site in Northern Ireland. Now, this trial was really motivated by promising preclinical findings that selective injury of the RPE using a nanosecond laser could trigger a, a beneficial healing effect in the retina, which could in turn help us slow the development of late AMD. So in the lead study, we went ahead to randomize 292 participants with bilateral large drusen to receive laser or sham treatment in one study eye at six monthly intervals. We then examined the outcome of late AMD development as defined on multimodal imaging, um, which included that nascent GA um, feature that Jason told you about earlier. Now, in this trial, we found that overall, the nanosecond laser did not significantly slow progression to late AMD when compared to the sham treatment. But during the study, we learned a bit more about reticular pseudodrus and that, that critical distinct phenotype that Sandy was describing to you earlier, which others and ourselves have shown to be associated with RPE dysfunction. So since this laser works through selective RPE injury, it was biologically plausible that its effects might differ based on the degree of RPE dysfunction in an eye as indicated by the presence of reticular pseudodrusen. And so when we went ahead to do a post hoc analysis, we found that in the study eyes without reticular pseudodrusen, there was a fourfold reduction in the rate of progression with treatment. Whereas in those with reticular pseudodrusen, there was a two and a half fold 
increase in the rate of progression with treatment. Now, at the end of the lead study, this 36-month randomized trial, two of the largest recruiting sites offered remaining participants an opportunity to enroll in this additional 24-month observational extension study where no further treatments were, were performed. And this really allowed us to evaluate the long-term effect of the laser after the final treatment at the 30-month visit. So when we looked at the 212 participants across these two sites that were involved in this extension study, we also did not see a significant overall slowing of progression to late AMD over this longer follow-up. We did, however, see a nearly fourfold overall reduction in progression to frank geographic atrophy that, that was seen on the color from this photo with the treatment. And we, we also continue to see strong evidence of treatment effect modification based on the presence of reticular pseudodrusin, where we saw a threefold slowing of progression to light AMD with treatment in those without reticular pseudodrusin, and an 80% increased progression rate in those with reticular pseudodrusin. So just to summarize, we, we didn't see an overall treatment-related difference in progression to our primary endpoint of multimodal imaging-defined late AMD over a longer five-year period in the lead study. But we did see um, at the end of the study that um, the laser did seem to have an effect on overall on slowing the progression to frank geographic atrophy. And over this longer follow-up, we did also see this persistence of that potential beneficial effect in those without reticular pseudodrusin, even though we stopped the treatments at 30 months. And, and all this put together highlights the potential of the nanosecond laser for slowing late AMD development in the early stages of AMD for those without that coexistent reticular pseudodrusin. And that's why we, it's really quite important for us to know about this phenotype. But what we really do need um, is further confirmation in well-conducted trials of this laser. And that, in fact, is what's happening. Uh, the company that developed this subthreshold nan nanosecond laser just a few weeks ago, early in this month, um, confirmed in a press release that a pivotal study is now being planned following feedback from um, regulatory bodies. And Professor Robin Geimer, who will be speaking later tonight too, uh, will be the principal investigator for this international multi-centered study that will be conducted in Australia, Canada, and Europe. And this study will include two protocols, uh, one that includes 250 people with nascent geographic atrophy, and they'll see them over 24 months. And another one that replicates the lead study, but much larger with 550 people seen with bilateral large drusen um, seen over 36 months. So that's what's currently happening in the early stages of AMD. I'll now pass over to Robin, who will tell you a bit more about what's happening in atrophic AMD. Thanks, Zee. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm going to now endeavour to share my screen since the rest of the team managed to do that without a hiccup. We'll see how we go. Um, so I um, had the pleasure to talk about um, some more trials that are underway in Australia and around the world, uh, looking at uh, people who have already developed geographic atrophy. So the next stage after what Z was talking about now, what if people have got geographic atrophy? Uh, what's happening? And so, um, as we probably all know, there is currently no approved treatment uh, for people with geographic atrophy, but it is an enormously interesting and now active area of research uh, in terms of clinical intervention trials. So I don't really want you to read the slide, but just it indicates how complex our understanding of what potentially other pathogenic mechanisms at play in AMD, so that this concept that AMD is multifactorial, there won't be just one pathway causing it. And so you can imagine the complexity of trying to um, interrupt this, these pathways and, and to have some intervention that might uh, be effective is, is quite a difficult task. So there are 
many ideas as to what could well be the causes of AMD, such as problems with the visual cycle um, pathway. Perhaps there's too much oxidative stress that needs to be reduced. The blood flow to the choroid is always there as a possible uh, potential risk if the, the blood flow is uh, reduced. Perhaps if we could just work out how to stop drusen from being developed, that would be a, a start. If inflammation has a role, then many are looking at trying to reduce inflammation. And then there are other possible strategies of perhaps we could put back lost retinal pigment epithelial cells or, or lost photoreceptors. So many places where people are thinking to intervene and indeed have started studies. So on the right here, um, you can see that there are many studies underway. I've just uh, listed what I, what I currently can find. But the one I really want to talk about is this bottom red box, the complement inhibitors or acting on inflammation. So can we reduce the amount of inflammation in the outer retina? And the reason why I want to concentrate primarily on these is because these are the closest to, to, the, to the clinic. They, they're not too far away. And so this uh, diagram, the red circles are around studies that are actually taking place in Australia and indeed at CIRA, where we're all located. Uh, and they're all based on interfering with the complement pathway. So I hear you say, what is the complement pathway? Well, it is involved in uh, fighting infections and uh, getting rid of debris. And there are three sort of pathways that are involved in the complement cascade. The final com common pathway involves this uh, molecule called complement factor C3. And then if you can see down the bottom half, it goes to C5. And then this activate what's called a MAC attack protein, which leads to cell death. And so when you look to see where companies are starting to intervene, they're at different locations for various reasons in this complement pathway. So as we turn our mind to just looking at what's, what's actually going on, I just wanted to point out to you some of the complexities in running a study in geographic atrophy. So this uh, example of this eye along the top shows you that over three years, the visual acuity remains terrific at 6.6. And if you think about the wet AMD trials, they all were based on saving vision, uh, but here, there would be no point having visual acuity as the measure of success uh, of a trial of geographic atrophy because we can see that vision remains normal despite the fact that clearly their atrophic uh, patches on these autofluorescence images increases. And so for geographic atrophy studies, the regulatory authorities like the FDA have agreed that you can measure the size of these lesions, these holes, and look at the rate of growth. So the outcome measure that companies are looking for is slowing down the rate of growth. So it's a long way from you know, a cure, um, but when we don't have any treatment to date, the concept that you might be able to save the fovea, because oftentimes, as in this uh, example, the fovea is spared till late. So if you can slow down the growth of these holes, then potentially you are uh, um, giving many more years of useful central vision back to patients. And so the first study is uh, run by a company called Apellus, uh, and it has a complement C3 inhibitor with the unfortunate long name of Pegcetacoplin, which is how I say it, which may be different to everybody else. Um, but it is being now in phase three studies have now finished uh, called Derby and Oaks. And so this is an anti-C3 peptide, and there were 600 patients recruited globally over an enormous number of sites, 200 sites, including some in Australia. And this drug was given by individual injections, like anti-GF, either every month or every other month, and they compared that to giving a sham injection. And so what they were looking to measure was the growth of rate of these geographic atrophy lesions in terms of area from baseline to 12 months. And these are the results put simply. So this is one of the studies called the OAK study, where they did meet the primary endpoint of slowing the growth. So you can see here in gray, 
is the sham arm. And then the orange and blue are the monthly or every other monthly intravitreal injections. And you, because the slope has gone down, there was a significant slowing of the rate of growth. So 16 to 22%. When they looked at extra foveal lesions, so potentially the most valuable ones at slowing, they did seem to get a, a bigger effect. They, you can slow down the growth of these So again, that concept of saving the fovea for longer looked quite impressive in the oak study. Unfortunately, in the Derby study, which was exactly the same study, so to get a drug approved, you really need two identical studies, both meeting their primary endpoint. And whilst the results were in the same positive direction, unfortunately, they were not statistically significant in slowing the growth, the primary endpoint, which was a slowing overall, the growth compared to sham. There was uh, more, again, more slowing in the extra foveal lesions um, compared to the foveal lesions in Derby. When they joined the two together, so when they joined all the results together, they were able to get a significant slowing uh, of the growth in both the monthly and every other month treatments. But what we don't really know, anyone doesn't know the answer to how the regulatory authorities are going to handle this, given that they didn't actually have two studies meeting their primary endpoint, yet provide potentially a treatment where currently there is no treatment. And uh, Apellus uh, now uh, put their drug forward to the FDA, and we all eagerly await seeing what the outcome of that will be. But if the FDA do approve this treatment, it will be the first treatment ever approved for geographic atrophy. And once approved in America, it should not be that long before it becomes available to us. Uh, and so, hence why it's very important for us to have this sort of conversation with us tonight uh, in understanding geographic atrophy. So the key messages from the Apellus anti-C3 drug, peg cetacoplum, was that given monthly or every other month, um, it did meet the primary endpoint in one study, Oaks, but not Derby. Overall, it was quite well tolerated in people with geographic atrophy. As I said, we're aiming for approval sometime this year. Uh, and then with great excitement, it will then be hopefully the first available treatment for geographic atrophy, you know, within 12 months, one would imagine. Not far behind the Apellus drug is a, a study called the Gather study um, with a very similar concept, but now blocking the C5 um, complement um, molecule rather than the C3, but still in the same pathway. And again, this is given monthly and by the graph, hopefully you can see very similar sort of trends, perhaps slightly bigger difference between the sham group in the dotted line and the solid line, this uh, anti-C5 aptima given uh, every month intravitually. And their results of their earlier studies look promising and they are now involved in their phase three studies. So not far behind uh, the Apellus drug is this very similar, same concept drug if the first one perhaps doesn't actually get approval. So there are other approaches of trying to deliver this complement um, inhibitor. So you can imagine it is not nice to think that we're going to face a world where everybody with geographic atrophy is looking for forever monthly or every other monthly injection. So it really isn't a sustainable long-term solution. So this drug uh, developed by Ionis called in, is involved in the Golden Study, is actually looking at a different uh, complement um, factor called complement factor B. And it's involved in the ampl amplification loop uh, that drives this complement pathway. And it's a different sort of drug. It's what's called an anti-sense drug. And it's aimed targeting at the target in the liver, which is where these um, proteins are made. And as such, it's not given as an intravitreal injection, it's given as a subcutaneous injection. So potentially patients could do this themselves, or in this particular study, uh, potentially nurses can, can visit in the home. 
So this is the first time that perhaps both eyes could be targeted because it's given systemically now rather than as a local injection in the eye. But because we dampen down the immune system or the, the anti-inflammatory pathway, patients in this study, they need to have vaccinations for COVID, but also uh, many other uh, common uh, infections. So there is a risk, I guess, of systemic complications in this elderly population that you don't face if you give it lower in the eye. This study is currently underway. It's uh, outside of the US at the moment. It's uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Sorry, it is in the US, but it's also uh, in Australia and New Zealand um, as a major player in this study. And then finally, just to mention, well, what, how else could you possibly deliver these complement um, inhibitors? And so we move on to gene therapy then, which potentially offers a once in a lifetime treatment, which in terms of geographic atrophy seems quite enticing that you wouldn't have to give this ongoing treatment. Unlike neovascular AMD, there's no individualizing the treatment really because there's no nothing to measure other than perhaps once a year a change in, in lesion size. But pretty much with those other treatments, everyone will get the same. So in this case, if you could give a one-off treatment to everybody, that sounds promising. The gene therapy is targeting a different complement factor, this one complement factor I. And what the gene therapy wants to do is uh, induce the expression of complement factor I because it down-regulates the complement pathway. And there are two trials currently underway, again, both at the Eye and Ear Hospital um, called Explore and Horizon. And these are uh, where you give a subretinal injection of this viral vector that holds this complement factor I. And uh, what's also quite novel in this suite of studies is that there's one called Telescope, which is where we have involved community optometry practices to identify people with geographic atrophy and then get consent for taking uh, a swab uh, a mouth swab to get the DNA. So this is a beautiful example then of expanding the recruitment for these very important studies into the community. And I guess that's what Z and I would like to talk about now just at the end of our talk is this um, community trial network that we were very keen on setting up and we have had running now for perhaps over a year. Um, so the idea of this is understanding that people with geographic atrophy and indeed the earlier stages, so the stage of just drusen, which is what Z was talking about with the laser study, do not come into tertiary referral hospitals often, are usually cared for in the community amongst all of you listening uh, tonight uh, in community optometry and indeed a general ophthalmology practices. And as part of the uh, referral and management of AMD pathway, we do suggest that geographic atrophy patients do come back every six months. They do get uh, imaged, hopefully with an OCT if possible, and that everyone makes themselves aware of what trials are occurring around them so that they could be referred for studies. Uh, and in the near future, potentially referred for treatment. And so what we've tried to set up uh, with, with CIRA sort of being the, the center of the hub is this network where patients can go into optometrists particularly, get whatever image or in this case, a DNA sample in the current um, gyroscope studies. And together we recruit or screen these people for studies. And so, Unlike neovascular AMD, where we can find people if presenting uh, urgently to casualties, we need everyone's help to try and uh, find these patients. So um, I'll just leave you if anyone listening is interested to find out more about how you can be part of this recruitment uh, network of ours, which we hope to improve and expand, please, please let us know. So I think I'll finish there. Oh, and this is just finally to show you, these are the currently recruiting trials and this is sort of like cheat sheets of what everybody needs. And if anyone is interested, we're more than happy to email them to you, which just summarizes the key 
inclusion exclusion criteria and what's being investigated. So I'll hand over to you Z now. I'll That's stop good. sharing. No, no, Olga, you can keep it on. Oh, yeah, okay. Maybe I can share. Okay. Oh, yeah, maybe we'll keep it on. Look, I think I just wanted to follow up from what Robin um, has explained. The reason why we've just got two poll questions over here. Um, in the past, what we've done um, as we've done talks like this is to really seek your help to help the, our patients of AMD. And the way that we can do that is to offer them an op opportunity to participate in trials so that we can find these um, promising treatments like the ones that Robin has mentioned. Um, but one of the challenges that we've found is um, that we've had quite limited success of people within the community um, sending people in for trials like these. And I think what I'd love, love to really try and understand is um, what, what are the factors um, and what are the challenges that you're facing? So um, the first question I suppose I will ask you first is, um, if Sabine, it's okay to launch the poll, is in the past month, how many people with AMD would you have seen? I'll give you maybe about 10, 15 seconds to click that if you could. And then after this, I suppose the follow-up question really is, um, once this one closes, is to find out if someone was to turn up in your chair tomorrow with AMD, and you've just heard this, um, these wonderful series of trials that are currently ongoing and available, um, uh, would you um, be willing to send someone in for such a trial? But we'll let this one close first. We're on 71%. Can you see that, Dee? Oh, no. no, that's okay. Um, let me. So we've stopped at 74%. Okay. It um, would be nice to be able to sh show, share it with you. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be. Okay, let me pop it up here. I'm just going to share my screen, Z, just so you can see it. And you can see it there. Uh, Sabine, we can only see questions. Oh, you but, can't see the poll. No, that's okay. You no, can read that that's okay. Me. So basically, um, four percent said none. Mm -hmm. Forty-six percent said one to five people. Twenty-seven percent said six to twelve, and more than ten people was twenty-four percent. Great. So wonderful. So it looks like most people do over the last month see a decent number of um, at least one to five people with or, or more. I mean, almost everyone would have seen someone with AMD. Now, I suppose that next question then is, if you had, if we, Sabine, we could open up the next one, maybe I'll share yep. it over here. Um, so tomorrow, someone turns up in your chair with either geographic atrophy or early stages of AMD. Um, would you offer them a chance to pass participate and be honest um we do really want you to be honest because we do want to understand what what the challenges are um that you face so and then we're just launching that now yep <clears throat> so we're just at about halfway half people have responded Really appreciate the responses and even though we're doing sort of a poll um, if there are opportunities to engage with you on a more personal level to understand really what challenges you're facing we really do would love your help to help our patients um, help us understand how we can make this process easier that would be great i think that we could probably close it end that one yeah and let's see if i can share it now if i share my screen can you see it this mm -hmm. time yep so about 43 percent of people said yes so that's wonderful um and i think quite a large proportion of you said no i really wouldn't know what to say to them or where to send them and that's the knowledge gap that we um could very would, would love to be able to address um for you so maybe we can find ways to share that information like what robin um told you about but 
the simplest thing that one could do is to point them to the fact that research is currently being undertaken in places like Syria and if you're interstate elsewhere throughout the country and if they're interested you could either help direct them to those websites or to help them register on websites like we do on, at Syria. so thanks so much for that feedback um really appreciate it I think we might take that on board and work on it so I might finish off tonight, then I think um, we will finish off tonight with the multiple choice questions. So let me give you guys uh, 40 seconds on each of them with the first one. If you've got that survey monkey link, I think ready, let's pull it up. And the first question is, um, what is the most appropriate terminology for classifying a patient with bilateral large chosen? Do we call them um, as having dry AMD, early, intermediate, or late atrophic AMD. Give you a little bit of time there before I move on. All right, well, that should be pretty straightforward. Maybe we can jump ahead to question two. Now, what are reticular pseudotrusin? This is the um, thing that Sandy was talking to you about. Um, is it a different name for regular small drusen or deposits located above the RP that you don't know, see easily on a clinical exam or deposits that are located below the RP that you can quite easily see on a clinical exam or in fact deposits that are located within Brooks membrane itself that you can quite easily see as well clinically. So give you another few moments. Yep, very good. Now let's keep going. Now, this is something that Jason told, um, talked to you about, and it is what is nascent GA or nascent geographic atrophy? Is it another term for GA, which can be reversed with new treatments? Or is it GA that becomes new vascular AMD? Or is it GA that develops uh, secondary to new vascular AMD? Or an OCT defined term that tells us about the early signs of cell death leading to GA? So again, I'll give you another 10, 15 seconds or so. Now let's move forward now. Uh, if you could go ahead and select the correct statement about geographic atrophy. Um, I'll actually let you guys read that out. I probably wouldn't read out these wordy ones. I'll give you another 10, 15 seconds to process that. Great, we'll keep going. And now question five. Now, this is related to um, the second half of this talk. Which treatments have not um, been trialed for slowing the expansion of geographic atrophy? Is it the subthreshold nanosecond laser, the intravitreal injections of the complement inhibitors, the subcutaneous delivery of the complement inhibitors, or gene therapy um, that targets, again, the complement pathway in another 10 seconds or so? And let's keep going. Now, these are going to be related to the scan, some examples that Jason and Sandy would have showed you before. So in question six, in this ACTB scan, what do you definitely see present? Is it just large drusen, just reticular pseudodrusen, both of them, large drusen and RPD, or nascent geographic atrophy? Right, just a few more seconds and let's keep going. And seven, what about this B scan? What do you definitely see present? Is it 
just again large Drusen or just RPD or both or nascent GA. Let's give you another 10, 15 seconds there. Wonderful, and we'll keep going. What about here? Um, what what do you think is definitely present on this OCTB scan? Again, is it just features of the early stages of AMD? Um, do we see just nascent GA geographic atrophy, or do we do you think see frank geographic atrophy only, or new vascular AMD? Again, let's give you another 10, 15 seconds. I see the number of interesting Q&A, so um, we'll see if we can get to some of those before the hour. Great, and now second last one, question nine. What about here? What do you definitely see? Again, is it just the early stages of AMD, like Drusen, Pigment, or RPD, or nascent GA only, or frank GA, or neovascular AMD? Giving you another few moments. And then let's finish up tonight with a question. What can we as optometrists currently do to help expedite the treatment discovery for non neovascular AMD? Is it that we can do nothing? Can we tell patients to stop smoking? Could we refer them for anti VEGF treatments or could we? raise the possibility that they could be part of clinical trials and refer them as appropriate. And just a few more moments before we wrap up. And Sabine, maybe this is where I'll ask whether you'd like to wrap up or do the Q&As. I'll let you. Yeah, I think um, we might wrap up and then if any Q&As come in, um, we could, if we have time, Z, maybe at the very end, we can answer I, uh, those. I answered all the written ones uh, by time. Fantastic. If that's useful. That's brilliant. No, that's great because I think we are a little tight on time. I just wanted to finally just um, talk a little bit about the Macular Disease Foundation. Of course, this month is Mac Month, so it's a really important month for us where we uh, try and get everyone to focus on macular disease in particular. And uh, we... Uh, of course, at the foundation, we work to support people living with macular disease and really trying to reduce the incidence and impact of all types of macular disease. And so we do that through the important pieces of work, which include um, ensuring that patients get the right information at the right time. So we uh, give them individualized support um, and we tailor it to where they are in their journey and whether that's educational um, events, whether it's um, brochures that we send out or whether that's them at, uh, attending patient webinars, they're all ways that we can help to improve their health literacy and give people a sense of power in their own journey. Of course, a lot of the information that we um, talk about is about the sort of lifestyle changes um, and dietary changes that people can make to stop smoking primarily, uh, as well as the peer-to-peer -peer support. We've developed a huge amount of different types of peer support now for people living with macular disease, and that sharing of the lived experience is really valuable, and you can really see how that impacts people's lives. And lastly, we'd help them to navigate the different types of government services that happen to uh, you increase the use of as you get older, and particularly when you have vision impairment, as well as connecting them with clinical trials like the ones that we've talked about today. And of course, referring is easy. You can refer via Oculo if you have that in your practice when you're sending a referral to an eye specialist or a report to the GP, as well as you can also uh, refer directly through our website um, referral page. And lastly, the MDFA supports optometrists. Uh, we keep you connected with all the news. If you'd like to scan, if you don't already receive our e-bulletin macular matters every quarter, uh, it's a great little synopsis of what's going on in the sector. We, of course, launched our CPD for optometrists last year. You can access, access that through all your normal providers as well as through our website. And lastly, of course, resources are always available to be sent to your practice at no cost at any time. 
So are there any last questions that we think we have time for in the last minute before we wind up? Someone wants question nine put up again, please. Yeah, we can do that. Question nine. That's that B scan. See what you think about Q and A's. I'm happy to stay on Sabine for a little bit if yeah. I'm past the hour. Yeah. That's fine by me. If you're happy to do that, Z, that would be wonderful. I'm mm -hmm. sure people would appreciate it. Are there any particular Q&As that, uh, oh, is it possible to see the Q&A answer? We could, should we go through the q and Is that something that people would like to do? I think for these B-scans, that's quite useful. Um, I think so. Yeah, all right, why don't we do that from the start? Um, well, we could even do these questions. It should be quite straightforward. So um, what do we call someone with bilateral large drusen? Not dry AMD, but intermediate AMD because they've got at least large drusen in one eye. Um, if you say dry AMD, you don't actually know if you're saying early, intermediate, or late atrophic. So intermediate AMD, let's be specific. Uh, reticular pseudodrusen are deposits below, sorry, above the RP that you don't often see. We've got a nice picture over here, but you don't, um, it's not always easy to see clinically. And even on a photo, you miss them half the time. Uh, geographic atrophy, or oh, nascent GA is an OCT term that um, obviously of features that subsequently in, indicate um, early signs of cell death. And once you have nascent GA, you actually have about a 78 fold increased risk of developing geographic atrophy. Um, Oh, these are very wordy. It's too hard for me to read late at night, but maybe we'll skip straight ahead to the scan ones for the sake of time. So over here, we see large drusen, no reticular pseudodrusen, which will be uh, above the RP. So that's the RPE line over here, um, elevated so that you only see drusen over here. Whereas in these cases, you see reticular pseudodrusen, that's these subretinal deposit because that's where the RPE is over here and the deposits are located above the RPE. Um, in this example, actually one that Jason showed, um, we see frank geographic atrophy actually, so not just nascent GA, but um, you see the RPE and the outer retina all extensively lost and the signal passing through over here because the RPE has been lost. Whereas in this example, the RPE is still relatively intact. Um, you do see some signal hypertransmission sort of signal passing through because bits of the RP have been lost, but you do see the subsidence of the inner retinal layers and this characteristic hypo-reflective wedge um, that define nascent geographic atrophy. And obviously we can help our patients by telling them about trials and refer them as appropriate if that helps. Does that help, Sabine? That's fantastic. Things? Thank you so much, C. Chow. I just wanted to say thank you to um, all of you, Sandy, Jason, Robin, and Z. Chow, for um, your time tonight. It's been a really fantastic presentation. And all I can say is how lucky are we as optometrists to be working in an era where we have OCTs, because otherwise we were working in the dark, really, weren't we? Um, I would like to thank all of you for attending tonight uh, and um, supporting our CPD program. And uh, if you would need any further information, you can contact us via our, um, our email or via our website if there's any issues. Thank you so much again, guys. It was a fantastic night. Really appreciate it.